body, the Security Council, to be held hostage to the ambitions of such a belligerent regime. It is time for the Security Council to shoulder its responsibility and address the real threat to international peace and security. The Security Council must promptly fulfill its duty under Chapter 7 of the Charter in response to Israeli reckless defiance. It must take urgent and punitive measures to compel this regime to stop its genocide and massacre against the people of Gaza and uphold its obligation, especially fully implement the UN Security Council resolution and legally binding orders of the International Court of Justice. The main and long-standing threat to the peace and security of our region is well known to all, and the attempts to conceal it through disinformation, a smear campaign, or baseless accusation against others are pointless and unfounded. Iran is never seeking to contribute to the spillover of the conflict in the region, nor does it to escalate or spread the tension to the entire region. Contrary to unfounded claims, Iran has no proxy in the region. No individual, group, or country act at the Iran behest. The U.S. and Israeli regime attempt to label the resistance group in the region as the proxies or terrorists. Their sinister aim is only to justify and legalize their malicious and destabilized activities in the region. The resistance group are not proxies or terrorists. They are legitimate and are only fighting against occupation and aggression of Israel in Gaza and occupied Palestine territories and of the U.S. in the region. International law recognized such legitimate rights against any occupation and aggression. Instead, the U.S. and the U.K. are fully responsible for all its decades-long aggressions and other crimes and unlawful measures in our region. Furthermore, they are responsible for all crimes of the Israeli regime, as it cannot commit any of such savage crimes in Gaza without the consent, order, and all out political, financial, and military support of and a collaboration with the United States and the UK. We reject the allegation made by the Israeli regime at this meeting. Such false and unfounded claims don't merit to response. Madam President, as a responsible member of the United Nations, the Islamic Republic of Iran is committed to the purpose and principles enshrined in the Charter of the United Nations, reaffirms once more its commitment to the maintenance of international peace and security. The Islamic Republic of Iran reiterates its consistent position that it does not seek escalation or war in the region, while warning about any further military provocation by the Israeli regime, the Islamic Republic of Iran reaffirms its unwavering determination to defend its people, national security and interest, sovereignty and territorial integrity against any threat or act of aggression, and to respond to any such threat or aggression vigorously and in accordance with international law. The Islamic Republic of Iran will not hesitate to exercise this right when required. Madam President, Excellencies, Iran has no intention of engaging in conflict with the U.S. in the region. We demonstrated our commitment to peace by exercising our restraint about involving the U.S. Army in intercepting Iranian drones and missiles bound for military target in the occupied Palestinian territories. This underscores our dedication to de-escalating tension and avoiding the expansion of conflict. However, if the U.S. initiate military operation against Iran, its citizen, or its security and interest, Iran will use its inherent right to respond proportionately. I thank you. I thank the representative of the Islamic Republic of Iran and pass the floor to the Syrian Arab Republic. Thank you, Madam President.
Madam President, uh, what our region witnessed yesterday is a natural and inevitable outcome of uh, repeated aggressions and grave violations of international law and the United Nations Charter perpetrated by the Israeli occupation authorities on the territories of my country, Syria, and other countries. In that, these authorities were taking advantage of the support uh, offered by the U.S. administration in this council and elsewhere. This American support, this blind and unlimited American support, has led the occupation authorities uh, to mistakenly believe that they are above the United Nations and above international law and above the conventions and the resolutions that were adopted by our organization for decades. The support led these authorities to believe that they can continue perpetrating their crimes and their escalation of the situation in our region with no response and no consequence. My country, the Syrian Arab Republic, has warned the Security Council and the Secretariat repeatedly in official letters warned of the dangers of an escalation, of the explosion that the Israeli occupation authorities are trying to spark to cover up for their military failure in Gaza and to find justifications for it to continue its genocide and other atrocities against the Palestinian people and the accompanying hysterical attacks on countries in the region. In our letters, we have repeatedly called upon the United Nations and the Security Council to take immediate action in accordance with their mandate. However, the U.S. administration and a number of its allies have obstructed any movement by the Security Council to shoulder its responsibility in the maintenance of international peace and security and putting an end to Israel's crimes and holding it accountable. The behavior of these countries is nothing new. These countries have prevented for over seven and a half decades, the United Nation from shouldering its responsibility to put an end to the Israeli occupation of occupied Arab territories and uh, to return legitimate Arab rights that are inherent uh, to those who hold them and in accordance with relevant United Nations resolutions, at the forefront of which are resolutions 242, 338, and 497. These resolutions are the basic foundation and the, essen the essence of a resolution to the Arab-Israeli conflict and the best means to deal with the repercussions of the Israeli occupation on the region, including the crises and challenges that it entailed. Syria holds the Israeli occupation authorities and the U.S. administration fully responsible for the Israeli attacks and any additional escalation that threatens peace and security in the region. Syria stresses that our region has suffered enough from the violations perpetrated by the Zionist entity and the U.S. administration and its allies, violations of international law and the principles and purposes of uh, the Charter, the time has come, to take serious action where these states uh, reconsider their destructive policies in our region and against our peoples. The time has come for these states to immediately and unconditionally rectify these policies, including through imposing an immediate halt to the Israeli aggression on the Palestinian people and countries in the region. The states must guarantee full and unimpeded humanitarian access, and they must put an end to the intentional starving of the people of Gaza. Moreover, there must be an end to the illegitimate military presence of U.S. forces on the territory of my country, Syria. We must put an end to the systemic looting of our national wealth. We must put a stop to the sponsoring of terrorist organizations and separatist militias. We demand a full and unconditional removal of the unilateral coercive measures, which in themselves are a form of economic terrorism and collective punishment that the Syrian people must be freed of. Madam President, 
We have listened to the statements delivered by some Western delegations, which uh, have once again expressed uh, their approach of hypocrisy and double standards. Some members of this council have grown used to offering their own interpretations of uh, the Charter and use them to serve their own goals and greed, including Article 51, which guarantees a basic right for all our states, namely the legitimate right to self-defense. The United States of America and Britain and France have launched repeated aggressions on my country, which, are, which is thousands of miles away from them. These attacks, these three attacks, uh, these three countries attacked my country collectively and individually based on a distorted interpretation of Article 51 and flimsy claims that are no more than baseless lies. They did not stop at that. Rather, they prevented the Security Council from discussing these attacks and from taking any action to uphold the principles of the Charter that these states are trying to replace with what they call a rules-based order. What the Islamic Republic of Iran did yesterday is a sound and practical exercise of the legitimate right to self-defense, as envisaged by the founding fathers of our organization and as guaranteed by Article 51 of the Charter. The Iranian response was an urgent necessity imposed by the Israeli occupation authorities' persistent crimes and hostile behavior. It was imposed by the fact that the three Western states who are permanent members of the Security Council have continued to obstruct the Security Council from taking any action to put an end to, to these uh, violations or even simply condemn them. This was uh, clearly manifest uh, in the fact that the United States, France, and Britain obstructed uh, the issuance by the Security Council of a press statement that uh, condemns the Israeli terrorist attack against the Iranian consulate in the Syrian capital, Damascus, which was a clear violation of all international conventions and uh, rules which guarantee the inviolability and immunity of diplomatic premises and personnel. And what else is to be expected from those who, along with their allies in the NATO, barbarically shelled the Chinese embassy in Belgrade in 1999? In closing, Madam President, on the 25th of April, 1945, the San Francisco Conference inaugurated uh, its proceedings, uh, laying the groundwork for the United Nations and the Charter, which is the guiding star for our collective action. And in the Charter were basic principles that confirm the need to respect uh, sovereignty and equality between member states regardless of their size today and more than ever before. Our countries must uphold these principles because upholding them means the success of the United Nations and its mandate. And violating them means dismissing the rule of law and replacing it with the law of the jungle, with wars and with instability. Syria is a founding member of the United Nations and continues to believe in this organization, in its principles, in its purposes. And we wish for it to undertake uh, its role in maintaining international peace and security and in dealing with the root causes of the challenges that our country is facing, namely the Israeli occupation, which is an impediment uh, to the peace and security in our countries and the prosperity of our peoples. I thank you, Madam President. I thank the representative of the Syrian Arab Republic. A direct attack from within its territory of more than 200 UAVs, cruise missiles, and ballistic missiles towards Israel in clear violation of the UN Charter and international law. End quote. Yesterday, the permanent representative of the Islamic Republic of Iran also addressed a letter to the President of the Security Council stating that, and I quote, in the late hours of 13 April 2024, the Islamic Republic of Iran carried out a series of military strikes on Israeli military objectives, end quote. He stated that the action was taken, and I quote, 
in the exercise of Iran's inherent right to self-defense, as outlined in Article 51 of the Charter of the United Nations, and in response to the Israeli recurring military aggressions, particularly its armed attack on 1 April 2024 against Iranian diplomatic premises, end quote. According to the latest reports, Iran launched hundreds of drones and missiles from its territory towards Israel, with most intercepted. Several missiles reportedly struck within Israeli territory, one of which damaged an Israeli military facility in the south of the country, and overall, a few civilians were injured. Madam President, when the nature of the attack became clear, I stated the following last night, and I quote, I strongly condemn the serious escalation represented by the large-scale attack launched on Israel by the Islamic Republic of Iran this evening, and I call for an immediate cessation of these hostilities, end quote. I remind all member states that the Charter of the United Nations prohibits the use of force against the territorial integrity or political independence of any state or in any other manner inconsistent with the purposes of the United Nations. Furthermore, the principle of inviolability of diplomatic and consular premises and personnel must be respected in all cases in accordance with international law as I stated when condemning the 1 April attack on the Iranian consulate in Damascus. Madam President, it's time to step back from the brink. It's vital to avoid any action that could lead to major military confrontations on multiple fronts in the Middle East. Civilians are already bearing the brunt and paying the highest price. And we have a shared responsibility to actively engage all parties concerned to prevent further escalation. As the Friendly Relations Declaration of 1970 states, acts of reprisal involving the use of force are barred under international law. We have a shared responsibility to secure an immediate humanitarian ceasefire in Gaza, the immediate and unconditional release of all hostages, and the unimpeded delivery of humanitarian aid. We have a shared responsibility to stop violence in the occupied West Bank, de-escalate the situation along the Blue Line, and re-establish safe navigation in the Red Sea. We have a shared responsibility to work for peace. Regional and indeed global peace and security are being undermined by the hour. Neither the region nor the world can afford more war. Thank you. I thank the Secretary General for his briefing. I now give the floor to those Council members who wish to make statements. I pass the floor to Guyana. Thank you, Madam President. I thank Secretary General Guterres for his briefing and acknowledge the participation of the permanent representatives of Iran, Syria and Israel in today's meeting. Guyana is alarmed over the recent escalation of tensions between Israel and Iran, especially in a region that is already experiencing intense conflicts. We urge the parties to exercise maximum restraint, to desist from launching further retaliatory attacks, and to seek the path of peace. Any further attacks will have devastating region-wide consequences, and also for the wider international community. The world cannot afford another war, and the Middle East certainly cannot afford, an, afford another war. The attack on Iran's diplomatic facility in Damascus earlier this month, and Iran's attacks on Israel yesterday, have only served to heighten tensions in the region. We urge the parties to abide strictly with their charter obligations and to avoid a larger conflagration. As with any conflict, it is always innocent civilians who bear the brunt, with women and children suffering disproportionately. We are seeing, for example, how civilians in the occupied Palestinian territory and other parts of the region are already reeling from unprecedented levels of suffering as a result of the ongoing conflict between Israel and Palestine. 
Madam President, Guyana further calls on countries of the region to fully comply with their international obligations and to uphold the principles of respect for sovereignty and territorial integrity. We also demand full adherence to international law, including the United Nations Charter, and for the parties to settle their differences through peaceful and lawful means. Madam President, violence begets violence and compromises peace and security. Guyana reiterates its call on all parties to choose the path of peace and dialogue. I thank you. I thank the representative of Guyana and pass the floor to Sierra Dion. Madam President, I thank you for convening this meeting. I also thank UN Secretary General, His Excellency Antonio Guterres, for his important briefing on the latest gravely concerning development in the Middle East. Siano refers to an identical letter of 13th April 2024 from the permanent representative of Israel to the United Nations, addressed to the President of the Security Council, confirming a request, and I quote, convene a meeting of the Security Council immediately, end of quote. And letter dated 13th April 2024 from the permanent representative of Iran to the United Nations, to the President of the Security Council and the Secretary General. Document S-2024-304, the identical letter of 13th April 2024 from the permanent representative of Israel informs that, and I quote, Iran launched a direct attack from within its territory of more than 200 UAVs, cruise missiles, and ballistic missiles towards Israel in clear violation of the UN Charter and international law, end of quote. On the other hand, document S-2024-305, the letter dated 13th April 2024 from the permanent representative of Iran informs that, and I quote, in the late hours of 13th April 2024, the Islamic Republic of Iran carried out a series of military strikes on Israeli military objectives, end of quote. In addition to his briefing to the Security Council just now, we take note of the timely statement by the Secretary General regarding attacks by the Islamic Republic of Iran targeting Israel, in which he, and I quote, strongly condemns the serious escalation represented by the large-scale attack launched on Israel by the Islamic Republic of Iran, end of quote, and call for an immediate cessation of these hostilities. Madam President, the Middle East region is once again, and regrettably, at dangerous crossroads. The escalating tension in the Middle East is dangerous and unprecedented, with the potential to destabilize not only the entire region, but impact global peace and security. Less than two weeks ago, in this council, Sierra Leone strongly condemned the use of force in violation of the UN Charter, relevant international law, including the development and conduct of friendly relations diplomatic and consular protections, as well as conduct in the region that may lead to an escalation or exacerbate tensions in the already volatile situation. In a similar way, Sierra Leone strongly condemns claim reprisal attacks not in conformity with international law and the UN Charter. With the Middle East at a knife's edge and at the precipice of a dangerous escalation, either by an intentional calculus or accidental one, with equally grave global ramification, the path to peace is certainly not tit-for-tat military attacks, but rather de-escalation and diplomatic engagement. To this end, we call on both parties and all other involved parties to exercise maximum restraint and resist the urge to the further resort to the use of force. We call on the parties and all other involved parties to be mindful of their obligations under international law, the UN Charter, and to comply with all relevant Security Council resolutions. The parties are unequivocally obligated to comply with their international law obligations, the UN Charter principles and provisions in good faith, in particular, the imperative for the peaceful resolution of dispute and the respect for the sovereignty and territorial integrity of each state. 
In urging de-escalation, CLA is also mindful of the ongoing hostilities in the Gaza Strip and the further imperative for the full implementation of Security Council Resolutions 2712, 2720, and 2728. The United Nations must not retreat from its important purpose and role in confronting the consequential challenges of our times. The Security Council must continue to play its part as envisaged by the UN Charter. Further, Sierra Leone expresses full support for the United Nations Secretary General and his envoys and representatives to use the good offices of our organization to lead efforts in ensuring de-escalation. All involved parties must move onto the path of peace, peaceful coexistence, and good neighborliness through negotiations. States with influence over the parties are called upon to leverage such influence for de-escalation and peace. Let us choose peace, security, and stability over war. I thank you. I thank the representative of Sierra Leone and pass the floor to Slovenia. Thank you very much, uh, Madam President. Uh, I want to thank Secretary General for joining us and for sharing with us um, his assessment of the situation. Um, I also want to welcome the presence of the representatives of Israel, of Iran, and Syria at the meeting. I would like to start by expressing our deepest concern over the recent developments in the Middle East. We strongly condemn the large-scale attack on Israel launched by the Islamic Republic of Iran yesterday. We resolutely deplore the serious escalation as we have done in the case of the attack on the Iranian consulate last week. The sequence of these events threatens to accelerate the spiral of violence, escalating into a broader conflict of unpredictable scope. It is crucial for all involved parties to recognize the severity of the situation and immediately cease hostilities. We call on all countries to respect and act in accordance with international law. We once again underline that the same standards apply to all member states, and all of us have the obligation to uphold the UN Charter. First, let me underline our concern over the regional escalation and its spillover effects. We share the concerns of the Secretary General that the danger of a devastating region-wide escalation <coughs> is present. It is imperative that every action taken by the involved parties be measured and deliberate to avoid further escalation since any miscalculation can lead us to the point of no return. The situation is highly alarming, deeply worrying, and it's extremely volatile. Second, Slovenia has consistently called for de-escalation unrestrained. Today we repeat our call to all actors in the region to show maximum restraint. We call on countries with influence on state and non-state actors to exert that influence and prevent, prevent the worst from happening. We urge everyone to choose the path of dialogue and diplomacy and refrain from further retaliations. We therefore welcome today's meeting as a step towards de-escalation and the peaceful settlement of the dispute. Thirdly, we have been witnessing the significant impact of the devastating situation in Gaza on the region, including along the Blue Line, in the Red Sea, and elsewhere. It is our collective responsibility to take immediate action. By adopting Resolution 2728, we took a step forward in addressing the crisis. However, our failure to ensure its full implementation represents a critical setback. Slovenia continues to believe that a ceasefire in Gaza would have a calming effect on tensions in the region. Every moment we delay, the risk of a broader conflict increases. Madam President, in these chaotic times, another major military confrontation in the Middle East could lead to devastating consequences for the region and the world. Placing the interests of the people in the region and international peace and security first Slovenia calls for restraint by all actors and return to diplomacy. As a Security Council member, we are ready to fully engage in a comprehensive response to the crisis in the region. Thank you. 
I thank the representative of Slovenia and pass the floor to the United States. Thank you, Madam President, for bringing us here today, and thank you, uh, Secretary General Gutierrez, for your briefing. The United States condemns, in the strongest terms, the unprecedented attack on the State of Israel by the Islamic Republic of Iran and its militant proxies and partners. Iran's intent was to cause significant damage and death in Israel. It launched over 300 munitions, including more than 100 ballistic missiles and land attack cruise missiles at Israel, as well as explosive unmanned aerial vehicles. Iran's reckless actions not only posed a threat to populations in Israel, but also to other UN member states in the region, including Jordan and Iraq. The Security Council has an obligation to not let Iran's actions go unanswered. Indeed, for far too long, Iran has flagrantly violated its international legal obligations, notably through the actions of its Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, or IRGC. By arming Hezbollah in violation of Security Council Resolution 1701, by arming, facilitating, and enabling Houthi attacks on Saudi Arabia and the UAE, and, more recently, merchant and commercial shipping in the Red Sea in clear violation of Resolution 2216 and in defiance of Resolution 2722. And, of course, Iran transferred Shahid one-way attack drones to Russia, the same drones it used in last night's attacks against Israel, at a time when such transfers were in clear violation of Resolution 2231. In recent years, Iran has also repeatedly violated international law by targeting with mines and seizing commercial ships in international waters of the Persian Gulf and surrounding waterways, just as it did on April 12, when it seized a Portuguese flagged ship near the Strait of Hormuz. Iran continues to detain both the ships and its crew comprised of citizens from five countries including Russia. Iran was also, in a broad sense, complicit in the October 7 attack on Israel because it has provided significant funding and training for the military wing of Hamas. This Iranian support contributed to the current crisis in Gaza. Colleagues, these and other reckless Iranian actions are not inherently defensive actions against other member states. Given the threats Iran's aggressive actions pose for international peace and security, we have a collective responsibility as members of the Security Council to ensure that Iran complies with the Council's resolutions and ceases its violations of the Charter. In the coming days, and in consultation with other member states, the United States will explore additional measures to hold Iran accountable here at the United Nations. More immediately, the Security Council must unequivocally condemn Iran's aggressive actions and call for Iran and its partners and proxies to cease their attacks. The United States also supports Israel's exercise of its inherent right to defend itself in the face of this attack. And as President Biden stated, we will remain in close contact with Israel's leaders. And let me be clear. If Iran or its proxies take actions against the United States or further action against Israel, Iran will be held responsible. We note Secretary General Gutierrez's statement warning that the region is at risk of plunging into a deeper and wider war on multiple fronts. The United States is not seeking escalation. Our actions have been purely defensive in nature. The best way to prevent such escalation is an unambiguous condemnation from the Council of Iran's unprecedented large-scale attack and an unequivocal call on it and its proxies and partners to refrain from further violence. Our goal is to de-escalate and then get back to the issue at hand, securing an end to the conflict in Gaza by getting a ceasefire in Gaza through a hostage deal, as well as surging humanitarian assistance to Palestinians in need. Thank you, Madam President. I thank the representative of the United States and pause the floor to Ecuador. Thank you, Madam President. 
I wish to thank the Secretary General for the information provided. I also welcome the presence of the permanent representatives of Iran, Israel, and Syria. The attacks carried out yesterday by Iran constitute a grave threat to international peace and security and to the much desired regional stability. My government has strongly condemned the attack against Israel and has called for an escalation of the conflict to be avoided. Such an escalation could have unpredictable consequences including a conflagration that could affect the whole of humankind. Ecuador adds its voice to the widespread call for tensions to be reduced and for threats to be avoided, threats which keep civilians in the chokehold of insecurity and anguish. I conclude by urging all to exercise the utmost restraint and to prioritize diplomatic and political instruments for the resolution of conflicts. I also call upon all to consider in good faith supporting the United Nations, regional bodies, groups of countries, all countries, with a view to easing this alarming situation, which, as, has, as the Secretary General has stated, could lead to military conflagrations on a large scale in the Middle East. Thank you. Algeria. Thank you, Madam President. At the outset, I would like to thank the uh, Secretary General, uh, Mr. Antonio Guterres, for his thorough briefing. The Security Council meets today uh, in the wake of the developments in the Middle East uh, yesterday that actually create a threat for a very dangerous escalation that could bring the region and uh, the world to an even more dangerous uh, stage where things get out of control and whose results cannot be predicted. My country, Algeria, is following these developments with utmost concern and interest and warns against grave consequences should the uh, circle of conflict in the Middle East broaden. That's why we call upon all parties uh, to uh, practice self-restraint and avoid escalation. would like also to reiterate what the SG has said, and I quote, that neither the region nor the world can afford another war. End of quote. And we have warned during the Security Council uh, session that have discussed the uh, attacks uh, launched by the uh, Israeli occupation forces on the Iranian embassy building in uh, Damascus at the beginning of this month. Uh, we have warned against the aftermath of uh, not putting an end to this arrogance and behavior of the Israeli occupation in the region. And uh, we have always emphasized that this could bring the whole region into conflict. And today, you can see that our point of view was correct and our wording was honest. That's why the Middle East is undergoing it, uh, very critical uh, circumstances that makes it incumbent upon all international actors to listen to the voice of wisdom so that we can all uh, sail to safety together while emphasizing that international peace and security could not be observed without uh, giving the utmost priority to the uh, principles and targets of the United Nations Char uh, Charter, the policy of double standards, and adapting and tweaking uh, and uh, focusing on the contradictory interpretations of the international law, as per whims and desires of some, would undermine our international order. Today, we are at a crossroads. Either we hold tight uh, to the international law without any adaptation or cajoling or blandishment, or we risk uh, being submerged into chaos and lack stability. The uh, crises in the Middle East are part and parcel of each other, and uh, they are all uh, interrelated, and that's why the root causes should be addressed, and the root cause is the Israeli occupation. The recent developments cannot overrule or cover the central question, which is the aggression on the unarmed Palestinian people in Gaza. And at the same time, we can never uh, use as a pretext or a cover for to launch a land attack against Rafah. And we would like to reiterate that it is totally rejected if, uh, uh, and we need to avoid any attack on Rafah because its uh, ramifications on the region uh, would be catastrophic. We would like to reiterate that uh, uh, de uh, de the de-escalation things in the Middle East on the short term 
would have to go through uh, reaching a ceasefire in Gaza and also to put an end uh, to the uh, heinous uh, killing machine uh, and the collective punishment that's being carried out against the Palestinian people. Uh, sustainable peace and security in the region would only be attainable through empowering the uh, Palestinian people of its legitimate rights and inalienable rights uh, as well, and to put an end to Israeli occupation across all Arab territories and that's why the Security Council should rise to the occasion and deliver on its functions on uh, the protection of international peace and security and uh, prevent any further deterioration and therefore to work uh, afterwards seriously on establishing the independent Palestinian state with Al-Quds al-Sharif, Jerusalem, its capital, and to put an end of the Israeli occupation of all Arab territories. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Representative of Algeria, and pass the floor to Japan. Thank you, Madam President. I also thank Secretary General for, the, for his timely briefing on this urgent matter. We are now witnessing an extremely dangerous situation that could cause catastrophic consequences for the whole region and the world. Japan is deeply concerned about the attack by Iran against Israel using numerous drones and missiles, which put huge population in, the, in real danger and could further aggravate the current turmoil in the Middle East. Japan strongly condemns such an escalation. We are seriously concerned that this large military action will increase the already extremely heightened tensions in the Middle East and lead to a wider and more serious regional confrontation with global security and economic ramifications. It is imperative for the Security Council to address this matter as a united body responsible for international peace and security to contain the risk of the region plunging into an abyss. Japan has been strongly urging the parties concerned to calm down and de-escalate the situation and exercise max maximum restraints, as the Secretary General just mentioned. Japan reiterates its determination to continue to make all necessary diplomatic efforts in order to prevent a further deterioration. We must end this vicious cycle of violence at the historical critical juncture. I thank you. Thank the representative of Japan and pass the floor to France. I thank you, Madam President. I wish to thank the Secretary General for his briefing. France condemns in the strongest terms the unprecedented attack that was launched by Iran against Israel yesterday and which threatens to destabilize the region. The Secretary General also condemned this attack. That attack was a serious and major threat to international peace and security and in particular to stability and security in the region. In deciding to undertake such an unprecedented act, Iran crossed a new threshold in its destabilizing action and is risking a military escalation for which it would be responsible. We call upon Iran and its allies to, at long last and without further delay, cease their destabilizing activities throughout the region. France expresses its solidarity with the Israeli people and recalls its commitment to the security of Israel, of our partners, and to regional stability. We welcome the fact that, very fortunately indeed, Israel was able to successfully repel that attack. That made it possible to avoid the worst and spare many civilians. France is working towards de-escalation with its partners in the region, and we call for restraint. President of the Republic, Emmanuel Macron, and the Minister for Europe and Foreign Affairs, Stéphane Sejourné, are working assiduously on that task. France is fully mobilized to find a settlement to the crisis besetting the Middle East for de-escalation and to enforce the principles that underpin our international order. In Lebanon, we We've made proposals to the two parties with a view to reaching, through dialogue, a cessation of hostilities. In Gaza, France is striving to bring about the immediate and unconditional release of hostages and to bring about an immediate and lasting ceasefire. It is high time, six months after the terrorist attacks of October 7th and the beginning of the war in Gaza, to lay the foundation for a lasting political settlement to this crisis by tackling the root causes of the conflict. That is what is proposed by the, resolution, the draft resolution that we have proposed to this council. We call upon all members to support it. We must no, leave no stone unturned in avoiding a new war in the Middle East. Thank you. The United Kingdom. Thank you, President, and thank you, Secretary General, for briefing us today. The United Kingdom condemns unequivocally 
Iran's reckless attack against Israel, which risked thousands of civilian casualties. The scale and nature of Iran's heinous assault, the first direct attack from Iran on Israeli soil, poses grave risks to the security and stability of citizens across the Middle East. The United Kingdom has long been clear that Iran plays an unacceptable role in destabilizing the region and that it also bears responsibility for the actions of groups it has supported militarily, financially and politically over many years. Through this attack, Iran has once again demonstrated that it is intent on sowing chaos in the region. As we have demonstrated, the United Kingdom will continue to stand up for Israel's security and for that of all our regional partners, including Jordan and Iraq. We welcome the actions of our allies to deter the Iranian threat. No one wants to see further bloodshed. The United Kingdom is also continuing to work urgently alongside the international community to stabilize the situation and prevent further escalation. It is vital that all parties exercise maximum restraint and refrain from any action that may heighten tensions further in the region. We also call on Iran to release the MSC Ares and its crew unconditionally and without delay. Iran's actions do nothing to advance the prospects for peace in Israel and Gaza. As set out in Security Council Resolution 2728, the United Kingdom remains resolved to work with international partners to secure an immediate pause in the fighting in Gaza to get aid in and hostages out, leading to a sustainable ceasefire without a return to destruction, fighting and the loss of life. Thank you, Madam President. I thank the representative of the United Kingdom and pass the floor to Mozambique. Thank you, Madam President. We thank Malta's presidents for convening this urgent meeting. We highly value the insights provided by His Excellency Mr. Antonio Guterres, Secretary General of the United Nations on this crisis. Madam President, precisely two weeks ago, when discussing the Israel airstrike on the Iranian diplomatic mission in Damascus, we raised serious concern that the incident could escalate regional tensions and could potentially lead to retaliation and heighten the conflict between Israel and Iran. Regret, uh, regrettably, our concerns have materialized. Yesterday, we wit wit witnessed a uh, series of military strikes on the Israeli soil carried out by the Islamic Republic of Iran, invoking self-defense and uh, Article 51 of the UN Charter. We express our deep concern on the yesterday's Iranian strikes. A tit for, for tat cycle of mutual aggression is not consistent with the logic of peace and peaceful coexistence between states. It leads to more death, suffering, and misery. It will further exacerbate the prevailing tensions in the region and may trigger more conflicts potentially involving other countries countries with unthinkable implications. We strongly believe that it is crucial for all parties involved to exercise restraint and approach the situation with prudence and wisdom. Careful consideration of risks and extended consequences is, therefore, essential during this critical moment. Madam President, in light of the current situation, it is imperative that all parts involved, Israel and Iran in particular, strictly abide by the Charter of the United Nations that compels 
all member states to refrain from the threat of use of force in their international relations. Stability in the Middle East is vital for the security and development of region and beyond. It is essential that states in the region and their allies pursue policies that promote peace and stability with due regard for a balance of interests. To that end, we council members individually and collectively must actively engage all concerned parties to prevent any miscalculation that could lead to broader conflict in an already volatile region. Such escalation would have a devastating consequences for civilians who are already suffering in Syria, Lebanon, in the occupied Palestinian territory, Israel, and the broader Middle East. We appeal that we strive for peace, understanding, and cooperation in the Middle East, acknowledging the legitimate concerns of all involved parties is a crucial step toward fostering stability and harmony in diversity. And let us remind ourselves that the central issue in the Middle East is the materialization of a two-state solution, whereby Israel and Palestine can live together, side by side, in peace and security, as two independent and sovereign states. I thank you, Madam President. I thank the representative of Mozambique and pass the floor to the Republic of Korea. Thank you, Madam President. I thank Secretary General Guterres for his important briefing on the grave situation in the Middle East, including yesterday's attack by Iran against Israel. The Republic of Korea is gravely concerned about the current situation in the Middle East, exemplified by yesterday's attack by Iran against Israel using numerous drones and missiles. The Republic of Korea condemns these large-scale large attacks, which are not in compliance with international law. To make the situation worse, freedom of navigation is now being threatened, not only in the Red Sea, but also at the Strait of Hormuz, which cannot be justified, regardless of any excuse. Since the outbreak of the horrendous terrorist attack by Hamas against Israeli citizens, on the 7th of October last year, and subsequent military operation by Israel in Gaza and ensuing humanitarian catastrophe. The international community, including the Republic of Korea, has repeatedly warned against the possibility of increasingly dangerous spillover in the Middle East. Earlier this month, when we witnessed the incidents at the Iranian consulate that resulted in casualties in Damascus, Syria, the Republic of Korea expressed its deep concern that additional violent incidents could escalate into new tragedies in the region. Unfortunately, what we are, seeing, we are now seeing this even more dangerous tension surging in the Middle East. Amidst the worst escalation in the Middle East, where the entire region stands at risk of being engulfed in the flames of war, what is crucial is finding the most effective solution to ease the tension, rather than finger pointing and the debating over who and what triggered the current situation. Thus, the Security Council should gather the wisdom of all its members. We can still step back from the brink. The ongoing es escalation of the already dire, ten dire tension in the region should immediately stop. Any regional escalation should be condemned and the regional actors should exercise full restraint in order to prevent any additional spillover. Thus, we take note that the permanent representative of the Islamic Republic of Iran expressed in his letter to the Secretary General yesterday the position that Iran does not seek escalation or conflict in the region, and we hope that this affirmation can be realized with the actual compliance. The Republic of Korea is monitoring this situation with a deep concern and once again calls on all parties to exercise restraints in order to prevent further escalation of the situation. Let me conclude by reiterating again what Secretary General Guterres pointed out yesterday in his, in his statement 
and today in his briefing, neither the region nor the world can afford another military confrontation. Immediate de-escalation is, as everybody understands, an urgent collective need at this critical juncture. I thank you, Madam President. I thank the representative of the Republic of Korea and pass the floor to Switzerland. Merci, Madam. Thank you, Madam President. We welcome the swift convening of the Security Council and we thank the Secretary General Guterres for his statement de detailing the events of the recent events and we underscore our common responsibility. Switzerland firmly condemns the coordinated attacks by Iran on targets in Israel last night. These attacks are part of a spiral of violence which is already dangerously underway in the region, as we also saw with the airstrike against Iran's consulate in Damascus on the 1st of April, an attack that Switzerland also condemned. Each of these attacks increases the risk of further escalation in the region. We also note with concern the seizure of a, uh, the MSC Ares, a Portuguese flagged ship by the Iranian armed forces in the Strait of Hormuz. We have repeatedly warned against the risk of accelerating the spiral of violence in the region. It is imperative that all parties in the region and those with influence over them exercise the utmost restraint to avoid further endangering the people of the region. We call on all parties to an armed conflict to respect their obligations to protect civilian populations and infrastructures. We repeat once again our appeal. The spiral of escalation must stop immediately. The region must not be plunged into an even wider and deadlier conflict at a time when we are facing a catastrophic humanitarian situation in Gaza and when tensions and exchanges of fire at the blue line between southern Lebanon and Lebanon, uh, Lebanon between southern Lebanon and Israel are at an all time high. We call for full respect and support for UNIFIL mission and other UN missions in the region. De-escalation must be the priority. This includes the implementation of Resolution 2728. An immediate ceasefire in Gaza is urgent, as is the cessation of attacks by armed groups in the region. We take note of the declaration by the Iranian authorities that they do not wish to continue their operation. We recall in this context that any recourse to the use of force must be in strict conformity with the Charter and that international humanitarian law must be respected by all parties. In such situations, dialogue is essential. The Council and all states must fully play their part in facilitating de-escalation. To this end, Switzerland is ready to bring its contribution. I thank you. The representative of Switzerland and pass the floor to the Russian Federation. <clears throat> Madam President, we listened very closely to the statement made by the Secretary General. We also noted, uh, um, Secretary General, the fact that yesterday you instantly publicly reacted and condemned the actions of, uh, by Iran. It is regrettable that, unlike the meeting today, you did not propose to, break, to brief the Council on the 2nd of April, where, upon Russian initiative, an emergency briefing was called to discuss the Israeli strike against the consular premises in Damascus. Were you would like to also see a greater activity on your part so as to convey to members of the Council information on other no less turbulent uh, topics for the Middle East uh, today. For example, about the um, now regular attacks by Israel against neighboring Syria and Lebanon. Um, if uh, such uh, um, attitude, uh, will, such things will continue unnoticed, then your appeals to restraint by all parties which we share can become futile. Distinguished colleagues, when we met in this chamber on the 2nd of April so as to discuss the strike by Israel against the consular premises um, of uh, the uh, Islamic Republic of Iran Damascus, we warned that what was needed was a strong and unified signal by the Council that such actions were unacceptable. And not only against the sovereign states of Iran or Syria, and not only in the Middle East, but anywhere in the world. We called upon the colleagues of in Security Council to clearly and unequivocally condemn such reckless steps to make sure that they don't get repeated. 
We also warned that otherwise the risk of a repeat of such acts and the general escalation in the region would grow manifold. We even proposed a draft press statement by the Security Council, and this was put together on the basis of uh, standards for chess cases, depoliticized language. And what did we hear at that time from our Western delegations? They said uh, that for them, not everything was clear and obvious, and uh, if what was necessary was to assess and see whether such a signal from the Council will help stabilize the situation in the region. The United States, UK, and France there essentially declined to confirm that the basic principles of international law about the inviolability of dem diplomatic and consular facilities, which are enshrined in the Vienna Convention on this issue, apply equally to all states. And um, well, the outcome is now clear for everyone to see. You know very well that uh, an attack uh, against a diplomatic representation is a casus belli under international law. And if a Western representation had been hit, you would immediately have rained down reprisals and would argue that you were right about this in this very chamber. And this is because for you, everything that has to do with Western representations and Western citizens is sacred and needs to be protected. But when it comes to other countries, their rights, including the right to self-defense, about their uh, nationals, well, that's a different matter, as you like to say. What happens then um, is you activate your f favorite argumentation about lack of information, you start doing legalistic care splitting, etc. And today, the Security Council we're witnessing is a display of hypocrisy and double standards, which it's almost embarrassing to watch. Um, Russia has warned on many an occasion that the fact that many crises in the Middle East are unsettled, first and foremost in the area of Israeli and Palestinian conflict, which are frequently fueled by irresponsible, unilateral, and um, provocative acts, will lead to a growth of tension in the whole region. We have stated on many an occasion that no country in the Middle East or Northern, Northern Africa should become an arena for regional or international confrontation or an arena for settling political scores. What happened in the night of the 14th of April did not happen in a, va in a vacuum. The steps undertaken by Iraq became a reaction to a disgraceful inaction by the Security Council. Um, and a reaction to an egregious attack by Israel uh, against Damascus, and not the first one, because Syria is constantly being bombarded by Israel. Many of you today did not find the courage to state clearly that the outburst of, of, escal of violence in the Middle East is developing against the background of an operation which is lasting more than six months, is unprecedented in terms of the number of victims, an operation conducted by West Jerusalem in Gaza and West Bank. And this is despite an unambiguous demand in Security Council Resolution 2728 to cease fire immediately. Such silence uh, about the deep root of the crisis is unacceptable, we think, especially against the background of uh, um, the um, tension uh, surrounding Iran, which is fueled by the U.S. and other colleagues. And the fact that Israel is not uh, complying with the Security Council resolutions is an obvious disrespect shown to the Council, to all of you who are here in the uh, members' seats, and a complete disregard to the decisions made by the Security Council. And non-compliance with Security Council decisions is not something that one should get away with, and it's fraught with sanctions against the violator. Madam President, we recall very well the dangerous escalations in January 2020 when the region was on the brink of a conflict as a result of an illegal elimination by the United States on Iraqi territory of Qasem Soleimani and a number of um, um, other Iraqi officials. But Washington did not draw appropriate conclusions from that, and as a result, the reckless acts undermining stability, security, and sovereignty of regional neighbors of Iran are continuing. We call on all involved in the incident, all parties involved in the incident, to, um, to exercise restraint under the extremely tense uh, situation on the ground in the Middle East. And the 
and the obvious risk of the council of, of the conflict uh, growing and becoming a re region wide. We expect that the regional states will resolve all of the issues they have using political and diplomatic means only. We also think it's important to make sure that the constructive international players assisted in this matter. The spiral of a confrontation and bloodshed sh must be stopped. We think it's urgent for the entire international community to undertake all the efforts necessary to de-escalate the situation. Otherwise, the region could become drawn into a vicious cycle of mutual attacks and violence. In this regard, we note the signal sent by Tehran that they do not seek a further military escalation against Israel. And we urge West Jerusalem to follow suit and reject the practice of provocative use of force in the Middle East, as they are fraught with extremely dangerous risk, risks and consequences for the whole region, which is already destabilized as a result of intensified Israeli-Palestinian confrontation. I thank you. I thank the representative of the Russian Federation. Pass the floor to China. To seniors. Madam President, I thank Secretary General Antonio Guterres for his briefing. I look forward to hearing the statements to be made by Iran, Israel, and Syria, respectively, on the evolving situation. Since the Gaza conflict began, the international community has deplored the unacceptable humanitarian catastrophe in Gaza and made strong demands for an immediate ceasefire to end the hostilities. It has also expressed grave concerns at how a prolonged conflict would exacerbate the tensions in the region with serious compounding spillover effects. On the 1st of April, Iran's diplomatic premises in Syria were targeted in an airstrike, resulting in multiple casualties on the Iranian side and serious damage to the said premises. This incident was a serious violation of the UN Charter and international law as it violated both the sovereignty of Syria and that of Iran. It was of a most egregious nature. A moment ago, Secretary General Guterres briefed us on the escalation that happened on the 13th of April, which China finds highly concerning. We have also noted that, according to Iran, its military action was in response to Israel's aggression against its diplomatic premises, and the matter can be deemed concluded. China calls on the parties concerned to show maximum calm and restraint and resolve their differences and disputes in accordance with the purposes of the UN Charter and international law to avert any further escalations. Madam President, this round of escalations is the latest manifestation of the Gaza conflict spilling over to the wider region. It serves as another reminder that the Palestinian question remains central to the Middle East issue and bears on the peace, stability and long-term security in the region. If the flames of the Gaza conflict are allowed to continue raging, then the adverse spillover is set to spread still further, making the region even more unstable. Countries and peoples in the Middle East have no desire for, nor can they afford, a larger conflict or war. Therefore, the top priority at this moment is an effective implementation of Resolution 2728 to bring about an immediate ceasefire in Gaza. Ultimately, there is no alternative to the full implementation of the two-state solution. The only way to end the vicious circle of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict once and for all, we call on the international community, especially countries with influence, to play a constructive part in the maintenance of regional peace and stability. I thank you, Madam President. I thank the representative of China. I will now make a statement in my national capacity. I begin by thanking the Secretary General for his briefing. The Middle East is experiencing one of the bleakest and most volatile periods of modern history, which risks spiraling out of control if all sides do not take a step back. This was a point that Malta stressed on 2nd April following the deplorable attack by Israel on the Iranian diplomatic premises in Damascus on 1st April. 
we had stressed the need for de-escalation and for maximum restraint to be exercised by all actors in the region. Regrettably, these calls for caution have been disregarded given the recent developments. We emphasize our deep concern about the significant escalation posed by a large-scale attack consisting of drones and various missiles launched by the Islamic Republic of Iran against Israel. We are also concerned with Iran's seizure of the container ship MSC Ares. The vessel, along with its crew, must be immediately and unconditionally released. At a time when our focus should be on diffusing tensions and reducing conflict, induced by including by advocating for an immediate and permanent ceasefire to the war in Gaza, facilitating the immediate and unconditional release of all hostages, and ensuring the delivery of sustained humanitarian aid throughout Gaza, all we are witnessing are steps in the opposite direction. Iran's direct targeting of the State of Israel risks regional catastrophe, with innocent lives bearing the brunt of all hostilities. We stress that international law, including international humanitarian law, must be respected at all times. Once again, we reiterate our call on all parties to exercise maximum restraint, including in their messaging, to de-escalate and pursue peaceful and diplomatic solutions to all disputes. Let us be clear, the region finds itself in turmoil and stands on the precipice of unimaginable hostilities and suffering. As the Secretary General outlined, and I quote, neither the region nor the world can afford another war. I now resume my functions as President of the Council. I now give the floor to the representative of Israel. Thank you, Madam President. Madam President, yesterday the Ayatollah regime, in blatant violation of the UN Charter and, inter and international law, attacked, attacked the State of Israel and launched 170 UAVs, 120 ballistic missiles, and 30 cruise missiles carrying 60 tons of explosive materials at Israel. This attack was launched from Iranian soil, as well as from Lebanon, Yemen, Syria, and Iraq. Colleagues, from the moment I began my tenure here, in every speech and in countless letters, I rang the warning bell regarding Iran. I called on this council to take concrete action against the Ayatollah regime. I made it clear that Iran and its hegemonic ambitions of global domination must be stopped before it drives the world to a point of no return, to a regional war that can escalate to a world war. Sadly, no action was taken, and last night the world witnessed an unprecedented escalation that serves as the clearest proof for what happens when warnings aren't heeded. Israel is not the boy who cried wolf. We have been screaming from the rooftops for years, trying to wake up the international community, but to no avail. If only this council would have inter internalized my words, it would not have needed the bone-rattling explosions of last night's attack to wake it up. Colleagues, last night, Iran proved again that it cares nothing, nothing for Islam or Muslims. The Iranian attack seriously injured Amina El Khassouni, a seven-year-old Bedouin girl in Israel. But look at this video that shows how Israel intercepts Iranian drones above the Temple Mount and Al-Aqsa Mosque. Here, you can look at it. This is the Al-Aqsa Mosque. To Iran, Israel's annihilation and igniting the region is more important than Islamic holy sites. The Ayatollah regime, in its plot to impose a global Shiite hegemony throughout its proxies, through its proxies, 
has even attacked Saudi Arabia, as we all remember, Aramco oil field, the United Arab Emirates, and anyone, anyone else they view as an obstacle. I ask the Algerian representative here, how does this make you feel? Is this a price you support, attempting to blow up mosques and murdering Muslims? Yet, while this direct Iranian attack on Israel was the first of its kind, it is just the most recent chapter in a blood-soaked saga that started from the moment the Islamic Revolution reared its head. The Ayatollah regime has a clear plan. Its goal has been and continues to be world domination by exporting its radical Shiite revolution across the globe. I assume you all know it. The Islamic regime of today is no different than the Third Reich, and Ayatollah Khamenei is no different than Adolf Hitler. Hitler's Third Reich was envisioned to be a thousand-year empire stretching across continents, just as Khamenei envisions his radical Shiite hegemony to stretch across the region and beyond. This is why Iran arms themselves with intercontinental ballistic missiles, ICBMs. Iran and Israel are on the same continent. You are next. The Ayatollah regimes act like the Nazi regime, and their army includes Hamas, Palestinian Islamic Jihad, Hezbollah, the Houthis, the Revolutionary Guard, and other savage jihadists. Instead of shouting, Sieg Heil, these radical Nazi Islamists scream, death to Israel, death to America, death to England. Just like the Nazi regime, the Ayatollah regime saws death and destruction everywhere it touches. For the past years, Ukrainian civilians have been killed from the skies with Iranian weaponry. President Zelensky, in condemnation of Iran's attack last night, said, and I quote, the sound of Iranian Shahed drones, a tool of terror, is the same in the skies over the Middle East and Europe. This sound must serve as a wake-up call to the free world. Listen to President Zelensky and wake up. Just like the ever-reaching hand of the Wehrmacht, Iran struck Albania with cyber attacks and launches strikes against Kurds in Iraq. We all remember the 2021 attack on the oil tanker Mercer Street in which British and Romanian crew members were killed. And just yesterday, Iran seized a Portuguese cargo ship. The crew be being held right now by Iran includes Indian, Filipino, Pakistani, and Russian nationals. Iran threatens global maritime trade. Iran is not only a terror state, Iran is a pirate state. Colleagues, just this week, the court in Argentina held Iran directly responsible for the 1994 terror attack in Buenos Aires on the Jewish Community Center, which killed 85 people and wounded 300. And just like the Third Reich and their brutal SS officers, the Iranian regime not only spreads evil abroad, but also torments and murders their own citizens. In 2023 alone, the Ayatollah regime executed 834 Iranians. The regime oppresses women while murdering them for not wearing their hijab properly. When the Iranian people peacefully protest this brutality, they are suppressed by live ammunition. Hundreds of protesters were killed and thousands have been arrested. This is a regime that allows its own people to die of thirst in Isfahan, while it funds terror around the world with billions of dollars. What have you done to defend the world from Iran? Seriously, the entire globe is suffering from Iran, including the Iranian people. Please defend them. For years, the world has watched, has watched the rise of a Shiite Islamist Reich. Yet, just like during the rise of Nazism, the world has been silent, deafeningly silent. Mr. Secretary General, Iran has been violating Security Council resolutions and the UN Charter for years. 
They supply Hezbollah with weapons in violation of resolutions 1559 and 1701. They advance weapons proliferation in violation of resolution 2231. They violate resolution 1540 and 2216. Why have you not used all possible means to condemn Iran and demand compliance? Why have you instead rolled out the red carpet for these genocidal jihadists? Why do you treat them as if they are interested in de-escalation when you know that the opposite is true? Colleagues, Iran's strategy has been crystal clear. Arm, fund, and train terror proxies across the globe to carry out Iran's murderous scheme of domination. But today, the mask of Iranian deniability has been removed. No more hiding and no more bluffing. No more shirking of responsibility. Iran has attacked Israel from its own sovereign territory, publicly and proudly. The mask is off. Iran, the number one global sponsor of terror, has exposed its true face as the deist destabilizer of the region and the world. And now, right now, is when the world must stop ignoring Iran's crimes and take action. As Iran's mask has fallen, the world's comp complacency must also fall. The mask comes off, and the gloves must come on. The snooze button is no longer an option. The only option is to condemn Iran and utilize every means necessary to make them pay a heavy price for their horrible crimes. Iran and its axis of supporters must be shown that the civilized world will no longer stay, stand idle. While many countries immediately condemned the attack, those who did not must ask themselves, how do you want history to remember you? Council members, last night's attack was a blatant violation of international law and the UN Charter. It was an act of utter escalation that can drag the entire region and world into war. But can you imagine if the attack was carried out under, under an Iranian nuclear umbrella? Or if, or if some of the Iran's, of Iran's missiles had nuclear warheads? The regime that launched an unprecedented strike on Israel, a fellow member state of the UN, is barreling towards nuclear capabilities. This is a terror state responsible for global destruction, and soon they will have nuclear capabilities. You all know that Iran is systematically violating the JCPOA and has enriched uranium up to 60% purity and even more. Iran's breakout time to produce an arsenal of nucle nuclear weapons is now weeks, mere weeks. No concrete action has been taken, and the IAEA inspectors have been kept in the dark. Iran is on the verge of becoming a nuclear power. It should terrify every member of this council. Take a moment to think what would happen if Ayatollah Khamenei could have launched a nuclear bomb last night. Is this the world we want to live in? So to the JCPOA signatories, I say, Initiate the snapback mechanism today. Initiate it. Impose all possible sanctions on Iran before it's too late. We need a world led by Churchills, not Chamberlains. Colleagues, on October 7th, Hamas, with Iranian funding, with Iranian weaponry, with training, carried out the most brutal massacre of Jews since the Holocaust. They slaughtered our children. They burned entire communities. They raped our women. They took families hostage and are abusing 133 hostages. Hezbollah, with its Iranian arms and sponsorship, have fired thousands of rockets into Israel since October 7, decimating towns. The Houthis, with Iranian weapons and instructions, and intelligence are firing at every merchant vessel that is suspected of having ties to Israel. And then Iran, who directs and pays for all of this violence, carried out an attack of epic proportions on Israel.
colleagues, we are being fired upon from all fronts, from every border. We are surrounded by Iran's terror proxies. The war in Gaza extends far broader than Israel and Hamas. All of the terror groups attacking Israel are tentacles, tentacles of the same Shiite octopus, the Iranian octopus. So I ask you, and be honest with yourselves, what would you do? What would you do if you were in Israel's shoes? How would you react if your existence was threatened every single day? What the Ayatollah regime thinks, they only think that Israel is a frog in a boiling water, that we are becoming accustomed to the threats on our survival and won't, won't notice until it's too late, they are wrong. You are wrong. This attack crossed every red line, and Israel reserves the legal right to retaliate. We are not a frog in boiling water. We are a nation of lions. Following such a massive and direct attack on Israel, the entire world, let alone Israel, cannot settle for inaction. We will defend our future. We run from the UN Commission on the Status of Women. Iran is the world's worst human rights violator, and such a regime cannot hold any UN position. No more red carpet treatment here at the UN. No more appeasement. Today, the Council must take action. Condemn Iran for their terror, trigger the snapback mechanism, and reimpose crippling sanction. Designate the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps as a terror organization. Action must be taken now, not for Israel's sake, not for the region's sake, but for the world's sake. Stop Iran today. Thank you, Madam President. I thank the representative of Israel. I pass the floor to the representative of the Islamic Republic of Iran. Thank you. In the name of God, the compassionate and merciful, Madam President, as we informed in our letter last night in response to the Israeli regime's recurring military aggression, particularly its armed attack on 1st April 2024 against Iranian diplomatic premises, a defense of Article 2nd of the Charter of the United Nations, the armed forces of the Islamic Republic of Iran carried out a series of military strikes on Israeli military objectives with dozens of missiles and drones. Iran's operation was entirely in the exercise of Iran's inherent right to self-defense as outlined in Article 51 of the Charter of the United Nations and recognized by international law. This concluded action was necessary and proportionate. It was precise and only targeted military objectives and carried out carefully to minimize the potential for escalation and prevent civilian harm. Madam President, we thank those members of the Council who condemned the Israeli armed attack against our diplomatic premises in Syria. Regrettably, in this chamber, certain members of the Council, including the US, UK, and France, has chosen once again to turn a blind eye to reality and overlook the root causes contributing to the current situation. In hypocritical behavior, these three countries falsely blamed and accused Iran without considering their own failures to uphold their international commitment to peace and security in the region. They made unsuccessful attempts to use lies, manipulate the narrative spread disinformation and engage in a destructive blame game. All the while, they deliberately disregarded Iran's inherent right to respond to the violation of a fundamental principle of international law, the inviolability of diplomatic representative and premises. Moreover, they ignored the underlying root causes of the current situation in the region. For over six months now, these countries, especially the United States, have shielded Israel from any responsibility 
for the Gaza massacre, while they have denied Iran inherent right to self-defense against the Israeli armed attack on our diplomatic premises. At the same time, they shamefully justified the Israeli massacre and genocide against the defenseless Palestinian people under the pretext of self-defense. They made cynical attempt to justify and cover up the atrocities of the Israeli regime against the people of Palestine by arbitrary and misleading interpretation of self-defense. Madam President, following the Israeli regime, cowardly terrorist and armed attack against our diplomatic premises in Damascus, the Syrian Arab Republic, on the 1st of April, we notified the UN Security Council and Secretary General of such international wrongful act, as well as of Iran's inherent right under international law to respond to such terrorist armed attack. Also, in a phone conversation with the UN Secretary General on 2nd April, Iran Foreign Minister discussed the situation and called for taking appropriate action and a strong condemnation from the international community for this horrific crime. We called upon the Security Council to strongly denounce this unjustified criminal and terrorist act, taking decisive and appropriate measure to bring the perpetrators to justice swiftly and prevent the requirements of the such horrible crime against the diplomatic premises of any member state. Regrettably, the Security Council has failed in its duty to maintain international peace and security. Russia proposed a press statement to denounce this atrocious act, which was backed by China, Algeria, and many members, but was blocked by the US, UK, and France. Faced with such circumstances, the Islamic Republic of Iran had no choice but to exercise its inherent right to self-defense under international law. Madam President, the root cause of the current situation are clear to all. From the start of the Israeli war against Palestinian people in Gaza, more than 34,000 civilians, two-thirds of them children and women, have been killed. All civilian infrastructures have been targeted and destroyed by Israel. Even humanitarian workers have not been immune from the military attacks of this rough regime. The absence of accountability and concealed inaction faced with the Israeli genocide and war crimes against the Palestinian people has only emboldened this regime to continue its violation unchecked. The U.S. and its allies have blocked the Security Council for over six months, protecting Israel from accountability for the Gaza massacre. They not only avoid condemning Israel for these atrocities, but also actively try to cover up them. Their sole priority is supporting and defending Israel, regardless of the consequences and at all costs. Despite international pressure and UN Security Council resolution calling for a ceasefire, Israel has defied this resolution. Rather, its focus remains on committing more atrocious crimes showing no regard for international legal obligation. Madam President, this lawless regime has committed many atrocious crimes against our people. This regime blatantly and openly admitted its responsibility for the terrorist and destructive operation committed against Iranian officials, scientists, and civilians, and sabotage against our peaceful nuclear infrastructure in recent years. This Israeli regime even made explicit threats to use nuclear weapons against a sovereign member state of the United Nations. This terrorist regime is responsible for all criminal and terrorist acts committed against Iran and must bear the consequences. The Islamic Republic of Iran has warned time and again about the repercussions of the malicious activities of the regime on regional and international peace and security. Iran has exercised maximum restraint 
Now it is time for the occupying regime to bear full responsibility for its consequences. This regime cannot avoid accountability. Madam President, Israel ongoing destabilized and irresponsible action and atrocities against the nation in the region are a real threat to regional and international peace and security. The Israeli Prime Minister's policy seeks to expand and escalate the conflict in the region to stay in power. The member of the Security Council must not allow such an august body, the Security Council, to be held hostage to the ambitions of such a belligerent regime. It is time for the Security Council to shoulder its responsibility and address the real threat to international peace and security. The Security Council must promptly fulfill its duty under Chapter 7 of the Charter in response to Israeli reckless defiance. It must take urgent and punitive measures to compel this regime to stop its genocide and massacre against the people of Gaza and uphold its obligation, especially fully implement the UN Security Council resolution and legally binding orders of the International Court of Justice. The main and long-standing threat to the peace and security of our region is well known to all, and the attempts to conceal it through disinformation, a smear campaign, or baseless accusation against others are pointless and unfounded. Iran is never seeking to contribute to the spillover of the conflict in the region, nor does it to escalate or spread the tension to the entire region. Contrary to unfounded claims, Iran has no proxy in the region. No individual, group, or country act at the Iran behest. The U.S. and Israeli regime attempt to label the resistance group in the region as the proxies or terrorists. Their sinister aim is only to justify and legalize their malicious and destabilize activities in the region. The resistance group are not proxies or terrorists. They are legitimate and are only fighting against occupation and aggression of Israel in Gaza and occupied Palestine territories and of the U.S. in the region. International law recognized such legitimate rights against any occupation and aggression. Instead, the U.S. and the U.K. are fully responsible for all its decades-long aggressions and other crimes and unlawful measures in our region. Furthermore, they are responsible for all crimes of the Israeli regime, as it cannot commit any of such savage crimes in Gaza without the consent, order, and all-out political, financial, and military support of and a collaboration with the United States and the UK. We reject the allegation made by the Israeli regime at this meeting. Such false and unfounded claims don't merit to response. Madam President, as a responsible member of the United Nations, the Islamic Republic of Iran is committed to the purpose and principles enshrined in the Charter of the United Nations, reaffirms once more its commitment to the maintenance of international peace and security. The Islamic Republic of Iran reiterates its consistent position that it does not seek escalation or war in the region, while warning about any further military provocation by the Israeli regime, the Islamic Republic of Iran reaffirms its unwavering determination to defend its people, national security and interest, sovereignty and territorial integrity against any threat or act of aggression and to respond to any such threat or aggression vigorously and in accordance with international law. The Islamic Republic of Iran will not hesitate to exercise this right when required. Madam President, Excellencies, Iran has no intention of engaging in conflict with the U.S. in the region. We demonstrated our commitment to peace by exercising our restraint about involving the U.S. Army in intercepting Iranian drones and missiles bound for military target in the occupied Palestinian territories. 
This underscores our dedication to de-escalating tension and avoiding the expansion of conflict. However, if the U.S. initiate military operation against Iran, its citizen, or its security and interest, Iran will use its inherent right to respond proportionately. I thank you. I thank the representative of the Islamic Republic of Iran and pass the floor to the Syrian Arab Republic. Shukran, Sayyid. Thank you, Madam President. Madam President, uh, what our region witnessed yesterday is a natural and inevitable outcome of uh, repeated aggressions and grave violations of international law and the United Nations Charter perpetrated by the Israeli occupation authorities on the territories of my country, Syria, and other countries. In that, these authorities were taking advantage of the support uh, offered by the U.S. administration in this council and elsewhere. This American support, this blind and unlimited American support, has led the occupation authorities uh, to mistakenly believe that they are above the United Nations and above international law and above the conventions and the resolutions that were adopted by our organization for decades. The support led these authorities to believe that they can continue perpetrating their crimes and their escalation of the situation in our region with no response and no consequence. My country, the Syrian Arab Republic, has warned the Security Council and the Secretariat repeatedly in official letters warned of the dangers of an escalation, of the explosion that the Israeli occupation authorities are trying to spark to cover up for their military failure in Gaza and to find justifications for it to continue its genocide and other atrocities against the Palestinian people and the accompanying hysterical attacks on countries in the region. In our letters, we have repeatedly called upon the United Nations and the Security Council to take immediate action in accordance with their mandate. However, the U.S. administration and a number of its allies have obstructed any movement by the Security Council to shoulder its responsibility in the maintenance of international peace and security and putting an end to Israel's crimes and holding it accountable. The behavior of these countries is nothing new. These countries have prevented for over seven and a half decades the United Nations from shouldering its responsibility to put an end to the Israeli occupation of occupied Arab territories and uh, to return legitimate Arab rights that are inherent uh, to those who hold them and in accordance with relevant United Nations resolutions, at the forefront of which are Resolutions 242, 338, and 497. These resolutions are the basic foundation and the the essence of a resolution to the Arab-Israeli conflict and the best means to deal with the repercussions of the Israeli occupation on the region, including the crises and challenges that it entailed. Syria holds the Israeli occupation authorities and the U.S. administration fully responsible for the Israeli attacks and any additional escalation that threatens peace and security in the region. Syria stresses that our region has suffered enough from the violations perpetrated by the Zionist entity and the U.S. administration and its allies, violations of international law and the principles and purposes of uh, the Charter of the Time has come, to take serious action where these states uh, reconsider their destructive policies in our region and against our peoples. The time has come for the state to immediately and unconditionally rectify these policies, including through imposing an immediate halt to the Israeli aggression on the Palestinian people and countries in the region. The states must guarantee full and unimpeded humanitarian access, and they must put an end to the intentional starving of the people of Gaza. Moreover, 
there must be an end to the illegitimate military presence of U.S. forces on the territory of my country, Syria. We must put an end to the systemic looting of our national wealth. We must put a stop to the sponsoring of terrorist organizations and separatist militias. We demand a full and unconditional removal of unilateral coercive measures, which in themselves are a form of economic terrorism and collective punishment that the Syrian people must be freed of. Madam President, we have listened to the statements delivered by some Western delegations, which uh, have once again expressed uh, their approach of hypocrisy and double standards. Some members of this council have grown used to offering their own interpretations of uh, the Charter and use them to serve their own goals and greed, including Article 51, which guarantees a basic right for all our states, namely the legitimate right to self-defense. The United States of America and Britain and France have launched repeated aggressions on my country. Which, are, which is thousands of miles away from them. These attacks, these three attacks, uh, these three countries attacked my country collectively and individually based on a distorted interpretation of Article 51 and flimsy claims that are no more than baseless lies. They did not stop at that. Rather, they prevented the Security Council from discussing these attacks and from taking any action to uphold the principles of the Charter that these states are trying to replace with what they call a rules-based order. What the Islamic Republic of Iran did yesterday is a sound and practical exercise of the legitimate right to self-defense, as envisaged by the Founding Fathers of our organization and as guaranteed by Article 51 of the Charter. The Iranian response was an urgent necessity imposed by the Israeli occupation authorities' persistent crimes and hostile behavior. It was imposed by the fact that the three Western states who are permanent members of the Security Council have continued to obstruct the Security Council from taking any action to put an end to, to these uh, violations or even simply condemn them. This was uh, clearly manifest uh, in the fact that the United States, France and Britain obstructed uh, the issuance by the Security Council of a press statement that uh, condemns the Israeli terrorist attack against the Iranian consulate in the Syrian capital, Damascus, which was a clear violation of all international conventions and uh, rules which guarantee the inviolability and immunity of diplomatic premises and personnel. And what else is to be expected from those who, along with their allies in the NATO, barbarically shelled the Chinese embassy in Belgrade in 1999? In closing, Madam President, on the 25th of April, 1945, the San Francisco Conference inaugurated uh, its proceedings, uh, laying the groundwork for the United Nations and the Charter, which is the guiding star for our collective action. And in the Charter were basic principles that confirm the need to respect uh, sovereignty and equality between member states regardless of their size today and more than ever before. Our countries must uphold these principles because upholding them means the success of the United Nations and its mandate. And violating them means dismissing the rule of law and replacing it with the law of the jungle, with wars and with instability. Syria is a founding member of the United Nations and continues to believe in this organization, in its principles, in its purposes. And we wish for it to undertake uh, its role in maintaining international peace and security and in dealing with the root causes of the challenges that our country is facing, namely the Israeli occupation, which is an impediment uh, to the peace and security in our countries and the prosperity of our peoples. I thank you, Madam President. I thank the representative of the Syrian Arab Republic. A direct attack from within its territory 
of more than 200 UAVs, cruise missiles, and ballistic missiles towards Israel in clear violation of the UN Charter and international law. End quote. Yesterday, the permanent representative of the Islamic Republic of Iran also addressed a letter to the President of the Security Council stating that, and I quote, in the late hours of 13 April 2024, the Islamic Republic of Iran carried out a series of military strikes on Israeli military objectives, end quote. He stated that the action was taken, and I quote, in the exercise of Iran's inherent right to self-defense, as outlined in Article 51 of the Charter of the United Nations, and in response to the Israeli recurring military aggressions, particularly its armed attack on 1 April 2024, against Iranian diplomatic premises, end quote. According to the latest reports, Iran launched hundreds of drones and missiles from its territory towards Israel, with most intercepted. Several missiles reportedly struck within Israeli territory, one of which damaged an Israeli military facility in the south of the country, and overall, a few civilians were injured. Madam President, when the nature of the attack became clear, I stated the following last night, and I quote, I strongly condemn the serious escalation represented by the large-scale attack launched on Israel by the Islamic Republic of Iran this evening, and I call for an immediate cessation of these hostilities, end quote. I remind all member states that the Charter of the United Nations prohibits the use of force against the territorial integrity or political independence of any state or in any other manner inconsistent with the purposes of the United Nations. Furthermore, the principle of inviolability of diplomatic and consular premises and personnel must be respected in all cases in accordance with international law as I stated when condemning the 1 April attack on the Iranian consulate in Damascus. Madam President, it's time to step back from the brink. It's vital to avoid any action that could lead to major military confrontations on multiple fronts in the Middle East. Civilians are already bearing the brunt and paying the highest price. And we have a shared responsibility to actively engage all parties concerned to prevent further escalation. As the Friendly Relations Declaration of 1970 states, acts of reprisal involving the use of force are barred under international law. We have a shared responsibility to secure an immediate humanitarian ceasefire in Gaza, the immediate and unconditional release of all hostages, and the unimpeded delivery of humanitarian aid. We have a shared responsibility to stop violence in the occupied West Bank, de-escalate the situation along the Blue Line, and re-establish safe navigation in the Red Sea. We have a shared responsibility to work for peace. Regional and indeed global peace and security are being undermined by the hour. Neither the region nor the world can afford more war. Thank you. I thank the Secretary General for his briefing. I now give the floor to those Council members who wish to make statements. I pass the floor to Guyana. Thank you, Madam President. I thank Secretary General Guterres for his briefing and acknowledge the participation of the permanent representatives of Iran, Syria and Israel in today's meeting. Guyana is alarmed over the recent escalation of tensions between Israel and Iran, especially in a region that is already experiencing intense conflicts. We urge the parties to exercise maximum restraint, to desist from launching further retaliatory attacks, and to seek the path of peace. Any further attacks will have devastating region-wide consequences, and also for the wider international community. The world cannot afford another war, and the Middle East certainly cannot afford another war. 
the attack on Iran's diplomatic facility in Damascus earlier this month and Iran's attacks on Israel yesterday have only served to heighten tensions in the region. We urge the parties to abide strictly with their charter obligations and to avoid a larger conflagration. As with any conflict, it is always innocent civilians who bear the brunt, with women and children suffering disproportionately. We are seeing, for example, how civilians in the occupied Palestinian territory and other parts of the region are already reeling from unprecedented levels of suffering as a result of the ongoing conflict between Israel and Palestine. Madam President, Guyana further calls on countries of the region to fully comply with their international obligations and to uphold the principles of respect for sovereignty and territorial integrity. We also demand full adherence to international law, including the United Nations Charter, and for the parties to settle their differences through peaceful and lawful means. Madam President, violence begets violence and compromises peace and security. Guyana reiterates its call on all parties to choose the path of peace and dialogue. I thank you. I thank the representative of Guyana and pass the floor to Sierra Dion. Madam President, I thank you for convening this meeting. I also thank UN Secretary General, His Excellency Antonio Guterres, for his important briefing on the latest gravely concerning development in the Middle East. Siano refers to an identical letter of 13th April 2024 from the permanent representative of Israel to the United Nations, addressed to the President of the Security Council, confirming a request, and I quote, convene a meeting of the Security Council immediately, end of quote. And letter dated 13th April 2024 from the permanent representative of Iran to the United Nations, to the President of the Security Council and the Secretary General. Document S-2024-304, the identical letter of 13th April 2024 from the permanent representative of Israel informs that, and I quote, Iran launched a direct attack from within its territory of more than 200 UAVs, cruise missiles, and ballistic missiles towards Israel in clear violation of the UN Charter and international law, end of quote. On the other hand, document S-2024-305, the letter dated 13th April 2024 from the permanent representative of Iran informs that, and I quote, in the late hours of 13th April 2024, the Islamic Republic of Iran carried out a series of military strikes on Israeli military objectives, end of quote. In addition to his briefing to the Security Council just now, we take note of the timely statement by the Secretary General regarding attacks by the Islamic Republic of Iran targeting Israel, in which he, and I quote, strongly condemns the serious escalation represented by the large-scale attack launched on Israel by the Islamic Republic of Iran, end of quote, and call for an immediate cessation of these hostilities. Madam President, the Middle East region is once again, and regrettably, at dangerous crossroads. The escalating tension in the Middle East is dangerous and unprecedented, with the potential to destabilize not only the entire region, but impact global peace and security. Less than two weeks ago, in this council, Sierra Leone strongly condemned the use of force 